that's it. That's all I got for announcements. So, Hebrews chapter 12. Let's go ahead and pray. Father, again, we just want to say thank you for the love of God, for your love, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. The fullness of who you are displayed for us to see in Jesus. Thank you. We just want to worship you and, and bless your name. We pray now that as we open up your word, you'd speak to our hearts and change us, transform us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, Hebrews chapter 12. We're going to be looking at the first two verses. These are just classic Christian living verses, and uh, I would encourage you just to commit these ones to memory because they are so important, so foundational, so profound for us. Uh, there's much for us to look at tonight, so let's just jump in. Verse 1 of chapter 12, Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Let's read that again. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Here in this passage, we see the Christian life compared to a race. We are runners, running the race that God has set before us as, as believers, and we are surrounded by a cloud of witnesses. Now, you notice the very first word of this verse is therefore, and Anytime you see that, it's an important connecting word because it is essentially saying, now because of everything that is preceding, this is the conclusion. This is how we should apply it to ourselves. And we know very well that Hebrews chapter 11, we took so many weeks to look at these different people who walked with God, who ran their race of faith, who demonstrated by their lives the faithfulness of God. Notice how it describes these saints of old here in verse 1. Since we are surrounded by so great, great a cloud of witnesses. These people of Hebrews chapter 11 are witnesses. The word in the Greek is martyros, where we get our English word martyr from. Jesus said in Acts 1.8 that you will receive power when the Holy Spirit fills you, power from on high, and you will be my, what? Witnesses, same word, same Greek word there, martyros. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. In other words, you are going to give testimony. What does a witness do? A witness gives testimony of what they know is true. And these people of Hebrews chapter 11 have been witnesses. If you want to think of it like one by one, they've been called to the witness stand, and their lives have demonstrated the faithfulness of God the goodness of God, the character of God. And so we now are to apply that to our lives. We're surrounded by these witnesses. They're like a great cloud. And they've ran their race. They've, they've walked with God. They were faithful to him who is faithful. And now they have been, as it were, uh, promoted. They are in glory and we can look at their testimony, we can look at their witness, and we can be encouraged to run as they ran. Now, how are we to run our Christian life? Three things that I want to look at tonight. 
Three things. Number one, we are to lay aside weight and sin. Lay aside sin. Number two, how are we to run our Christian life? We are to run with endurance. And thirdly, we are to look unto Jesus. That's how we run. Now let's look at each of those things in a little bit more detail. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. Now, I don't know if uh, you guys watched the Olympics um, during the summertime. I always liked the Summer Olympics. Uh, wasn't it funny? It was the 2020 Olympics in 2021. I, I, I didn't quite understand why they didn't just call it the 2021 Olympics, maybe because they had printed all the brochures and made all the T-shirts or whatnot. But, but nonetheless, if you watched the Olympics, um, and you, particularly the track and field, you'll notice that those runners, those people who are competing, or, or you watch the marathon, they're not wearing much, right? They're wearing extremely light clothes. They're, they're, they've shed every ounce that they possibly could. Why? So that they can run as efficiently as possible. Now, a lot of you guys know that um, in high school and in college, I ran. I ran for Paradise High, and I got to run for Chico State for a couple years. And it was the same thing. Uh, we wore clothing, even on the coldest of days, later on as the, as the season progressed. It didn't matter. It could be snowing. And, uh, but if you were racing, you, you wore a tank top and you wore shorts, and they were made of this extremely light material. Because, and, and even the shoes that we wore, we'd have special race day shoes that we called race flats. And uh, what were they? They were the lightest possible shoe that you could get. And uh, you wouldn't train in them because uh, it'd be too much impact on your body. And, and so your training shoes were a lot thicker and a lot heavier. But man, that, that race day, you'd get into your racing flats, your racing shoes, and you just feel like, you know, the, the fastest you could possibly be. For every ounce that you, you could shed from your shoes, your clothing, it was to your advantage. And so it is in our Christian life that we are to lay aside anything, any weight, any, any encumbrance that would prevent us from running the race that God has called us to run. Imagine watching the uh, Olympic marathon and, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're seeing all the runners, they're stretching, they're, they're getting their jitters out, you know, they're you know, doing some sprints and stuff like that, getting hydrated. And you look over and you see this guy who's got a, a backpack and he's just filling it up with rocks, right? And then you notice him zip up the backpack and, and put it on. Now, he's, he's thinking, oh, you know, yeah, I just... Uh, I want to challenge myself. I want to see how far I can run with this thing. But there's no way that that guy with the, the backpack full of rocks is going to be able to compete in that marathon. There's no way that he's actually even going to win, may not even finish. Some of us are living our Christian life with, with a backpack full of rocks on. And tonight, Jesus wants to come and take that bag of rocks off your shoulders. He wants to lighten your load tonight so that you can run that race that he set before you. What are these hindrances? What are these encumbrances? Oh, if it was only as simple as taking off a backpack full of rocks. Well, what are the things that weigh us down? Fear, doubt, shame, these are weights that we're not going to be able to run well in our Christian life if we've got these things around our neck. And, and tonight, Jesus wants to show you his faithfulness. He wants you to entrust all of your life to him. That, that you might run, as it were, with, with, with a lightness in your step that you might be empowered to walk and run in all that he has called you to. So let us, we have to lay these things aside. Notice um, what else we have here. What else are we to lay aside? Not only these, 
these weights. By the way, weights, what else could they be? They could be distractions. They could be good things. They could be things that aren't necessarily sinful, but things that are just crowding out our relationship with God. Things that are distracting us from the course that, that Jesus has set for us. That could be, uh, uh, you know, hobbies. That could be um, an over-focus on, on work, being, being like a workaholic, working too much. That could be allowing a, a relationship with another person to, to crowd out that space, that place that only Jesus should have. And so right now, we just want to allow the Lord to speak to our hearts. Lord, is there any weight? Is there anything that's in my life, a distraction, the cares of this world that, like the, the thistles and the thorns, the briars, are, are choking out the good seed that you're wanting to grow in my life? So allow the Lord, allow the Holy Spirit right now just to bring a sense of, is he putting his finger on something that he says, you know, this has too high of a priority in your life. You're like this guy with... with a bunch of rocks in his backpack, let me take that from you. It's a weight. Again, it might seem like a good thing, but, but it's actually a weight. It's actually holding you back. So let us lay aside every weight. And now he says also, and the sin. Notice the sin. There's a specific nature to this sin. The sin which ensnares us. Now, this isn't like a bag of rocks. This is more like a, a cord wrapped around your legs. <laughs> Again, to, to picture the runner, the marathon runner, not just with a bag of rocks around his, uh, you know, in his backpack, but also his feet tied up with cords. He's not going to go anywhere. That, that guy is not, I mean, he can maybe hop a few steps, but that's it. Sin is like a cord wrapped around our feet, the feet of a Christian. And notice what the author says here, the sin which so easily ensnares us. The idea with this um, the picture is, is like sin is at your door. It's right there. It's, it's a sin in your life that is easily accessible to you. It's a sin that is... Um, something that you fall into without much trouble. <laughs> it easily ensnares you. Does anybody, can anybody relate to that? Thank you. Okay, two, thank three, four honest people. All right, the rest of you guys, um, well, maybe, you're, maybe you are being honest. You should probably be up here teaching instead of me. So you can come and share your wisdom and knowledge with us. Hey, come on now. Every single one of us understands what he's talking about. If you've been walking with Jesus for any amount of time, you understand what it is for the flesh to war against the spirit. And these two, Paul tells us in the book of Galatians, are contrary to one another so that what? You do not do that which you want to do. Paul would talk about this in Romans chapter seven. He goes, man, the things I want to do, I, I don't do. The things that I don't want to do, I do. Help me. You know, who will deliver me from this body of death? And so the author is, is talking about this, this sin. It so easily ensnares us. And, and you, you know exactly what the Holy Spirit is putting his finger on right now in your life. What is it that so easily ensnares you? Well, what we are to do with the weight, what we are to do with the sin is to lay it down. Just lay it down. Just put it down. Take, take off that, that old nasty garment. That's um, in the book of Colossians. It, it says, let us lay aside all these things and it lists all these sins. Put off, you know, pride and, and arrogance and uh, malice and all these things. We're to put these things on and put on, or excuse me, we're to put those things off and we're to put on Christ. So lay these things aside. Acknowledge, number one, that it's sin and repent of it. Agree with God and turn away from it. You know, you cannot 
get this bag of rocks off yourself. You cannot get that cord off your feet yourself. It is really a work of God to do these things. But if you can just acknowledge tonight, Lord, I can't get free from this stuff. I'm weighed down. I'm tied up. And I'm asking right now, Lord, that you would come and bring freedom to my life. He wants to do that. That's what Jesus does. He's in the business of setting people free. Setting people free from sin. You shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. That's what he wants to do. So allow the Lord just to take these things, but we have to acknowledge it first. We have to repent of it, and then say, Lord, come in and clean this mess up. <laughs> he is our only hope. So that's the first thing. We've got to lay aside the weight and the sin that so easily ensnares us. And then he says here, and let us run with endurance. How are we going to run our race? Well, you've got to run it with endurance. Now, I like the, uh, the old King James. It says to run with patience. To run with patience. Let us run with endurance. Now, I like this idea in the original, the Greek, when it says, let us run, it, it means to continue running. Let us keep on running with endurance. In other words, don't stop. Don't give up. Don't quit. I... Uh, Sorry, you're going to get a bunch of running analogies tonight because, well, that's just all I got, and uh, this whole thing's about running. So I remember when I was in high school, uh, we did, uh, our team participated in this thing. It's called the Tahoe Relay, and there's seven uh, legs around the entire uh, lake, Lake Tahoe, and it, the circumference, I guess, or whatever, the perimeter of Lake Tahoe is about 70 miles. So each leg is about 10 miles. And uh, I got leg number six. And leg number six is by Emerald Bay. And it is a beautiful run. You're at, you know, 6,000 plus feet elevation. But the entirety of leg six, it's eight and, over eight and a half miles long. And it's all uphill. All of it. <laughs> and guess who got leg number six, right? And so... Um, this was my goal. When I started running, I just said, don't stop. Just, if, if I can run these eight and a half miles and just not stop running, I don't care what time I get. I'm not running against anybody else. I just don't want to stop. And so, um, by the grace of God, I was able to not stop during that whole time. But, but I really think that's a great analogy to, to what we're faced with here in our Christian life continue in your race. You've got to remember that this was written, this book, the book of Hebrews, was written to a group of people who wanted to quit. They wanted to stop. They were being pressured by friends and families and family members and co-workers and just the society in general to stop, to depart from Christ. And the author is saying, don't stop running. Let us continue to run, and he says, with endurance. The Christian life is a marathon. 26.2 miles, that's how long a marathon is. It, it is not a 100-meter sprint. It is a long-distance race. And in order to run a long-distance race, you need endurance. Now, how do we get endurance? How does that come? In running, it just means hours and hours and hours on the trail, just running. My coach in high school, he used to say, okay, today we're going to do some LSD, all right? <laughs> like, what? Long, slow distance, LSD. And, and sorry, you know, that's just what he said. And uh, thanks, Coach Robert. So at any rate, we would do that. We would run, and we'd just go for hours, and hours, and, and you'd run for a very long time. And so um, 
what was the purpose of that? It was to develop endurance. It was to give you um, just that, that ability to keep on going. When, when you got down to those, those, that final stretch, you would still have some gas in the tank. Now, endurance on the trail, it just, you know, it takes hours and hours. There's no other way around it. There's no shortcut to endurance. There's no pill you can take. There's nothing that can substitute for just putting in the miles. And so what does it mean to have endurance? How do we get endurance in our Christian faith, in our Christian life? Well, through hours and hours with the Savior. Through walking with Him on the path of life. Developing spiritual stamina that comes through testing and trials and seeing the faithfulness of God. It, it means just walking with Jesus over the long haul. You know, in order to have endurance, you have to be taken to the limit of what you have physically. And in order to build endurance spiritually, we're brought to places and positions and in, in circumstances that are, are too much for us. They're too great for us. But that's kind of the point. Because when we come to the end of ourselves, that is when we're able to say, Lord, I need you. I'm, I'm, I'm beyond my own strength. And, and this is when we see God come in and carry us through. And time and time again, as we see the Lord being faithful in our lives, this gives us a spiritual stamina, a, a spiritual endurance, a spiritual patience as we just wait upon the Lord, as we trust Him, as we, we, we just don't doubt. We say we know that God has been faithful in the past and He's going to be faithful in the present. This is what spiritual endurance is all about. So let us run with endurance, with patience, waiting on the Lord, trusting in the Lord, and notice the race that is set before us. The race that God has you on is unique to you. You're going to go through different things than I'm going to go through. You're going to face different trials than your neighbor will face. Some financial issues, some with physical issues, some a loss of a loved one. There's, there's various challenges in each of our race that is unique to us. And so don't compare yourself. Run the race that God has set for you. Not the one for your neighbor, not the one, you know, for, for somebody over there. Now, what has he set before you? You be faithful to the race that he set before you. Run your race. But here's something that we all must do in common. What is it that we're all, we're all running in a race? It's a, it's a different race for you than it is for me. But notice, we all are to do this one thing. Verse 2, looking unto Jesus. Looking unto Jesus. How do we run it is with our eyes on our Savior. We must, we must keep our eyes on Him. If our eyes are anywhere else, if our eyes are on other people, if our eyes are on politicians, if our eyes are on our own wealth or our hope in ourselves, we're going to be disappointed. We must keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. You know how you lose a race? You lose a race by constantly looking behind you. And, and I can attest to that. It was my final league race of my junior year. I was the favored to win. We were running up at Shasta. It was a cold day. And uh, we were up there. We had PV and, and Chico and Red Bluff, Shasta, Central Valley. And uh, we were there. And I wasn't feeling 100%, but I thought, you know, I, I've got a really good chance of winning this race. And so I was leading pretty much the entire race. It came down to the last half mile, and uh, it was as if the gorilla had gotten on my back. I 
was sucking wind. I was not feeling good. And I, I was thinking, man, I just I got to hold on. And I was running not to win, but I was, I was running not to lose. And I began to look behind. And I, I began to hear footprints coming up and, and, and the footfall and kept on looking behind, looking behind. And once I did that, once I was looking behind myself, <clears throat> I mentally fell apart. I was not looking ahead and keeping my eyes on the finish line, but I was concerned about what was going on behind me. And pretty soon, that, once that happened, you know, that, that runner came and passed me and another one came and passed me. And, and my coach, I remember talking with him later on, and he says, once I saw you look behind you, he said, I knew that you had lost it mentally. I knew that you had lost the race right then and there. And, and so it is with us. We have got to keep our eyes forward. You know, I think of, of Lot's wife, right? <laughs> what did she do? Don't look back. Don't look behind you. And she looks back with longing, right? We don't want to look back and look behind and, and wonder about what's going on behind us or, or what about this person or what about that thing? that thing that seems so alluring or so enticing or, or so much better, we've got to keep looking straight ahead, looking unto Jesus. He is our hope. He is our strength. If we are looking unto anybody else to save us, we're going to be disappointed. We're going to be let down. Christ alone is the Savior, looking unto Jesus. And we've got this cloud of witnesses, yes, and they're encouraging us to do what? <laughs> Look to Jesus. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Now, as we look to him, notice what it says. He is the author and the finisher of our faith. I love that. The author and finisher. It's like the one who began our faith and the one who finishes it. He is the A to Z of our faith. The alpha and the omega. The beginning and the end. He is the founder of your faith. The reason that you are saved is because of Jesus. He is called the author because he has written your story. He knows you're sitting down and you're rising up. He knows your thoughts afar off. He knew all of your days as before yet even one had occurred. He is the author, the writer. In other places, this word author is uh, translated as captain. He's the captain of our faith, the leader, the one who is leading the way for us navigating the trail of life as it were. If we follow him, if we keep our eyes on him, he is going to lead us down the straight and narrow path. Our good shepherd going before us, leading the way through the valley of the shadow of death to the green pastures, to the still waters. The author, the founder, but notice also, he is the finisher. I love this. He who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. He is going to finish the work that he started. That's very encouraging to me. Hope it's encouraging to you. You know, sometimes you just get so discouraged. You think, man, Lord, how am I ever I don't feel like I'm growing, Lord. I don't feel like I've, I've made any progress in my spiritual life. We just need to keep on looking unto him. The author and the perfecter, the finisher. Don't look at yourself and you be discouraged every time. You look at yourself, you're going to, to just lose hope. But we need to see ourselves in Christ Jesus. That is our spiritual location. And it is only in him that there is a hope of glory for any of us. So we look unto Jesus, the 
author of our faith, the finisher of our faith. All that we need is found in him. And we look unto him as the ultimate example of faith. Notice what it says here. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Jesus is the ultimate example of what a life of faith is. He is the crown jewel, so to speak, of the hall of faith. And he displayed that faith as he went to the cross. Jesus endured the cross. That was his race. That is the work that the Father had set before him. And how was he able to endure the cross? Notice what it says. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. He was looking beyond the cross and he saw hope. <laughs> he saw you and me. He saw glorifying the Father. As he walked in obedience to the Father, he knew he was bringing glory to his Father. That was the joy that was set before him. Glorifying his Father in heaven. The joy that was set before him was bringing you into the family. Accomplishing the work of redemption. Making salvation possible for you and for me. That is how he endured what he endured the joy that was set before him. And how is it that we endure? We have a joy that is set before us tonight as well. And that joy is the hope of heaven. It's the hope of our inheritance. It's the hope of eternal life, which is knowing God. That is our inheritance. This is eternal life, John 17, 3, that they may know you. That's what eternal life is all about. And this is what we have as the joy before us tonight, the hope of our inher eternal inheritance with God in heaven. That is how we endure. Just as Jesus endured, so we endure. Who for the joy that was set before him, notice, endured the cross, despising the shame. The cross was a, a humiliating and shameful, horrific death. It's interesting, you know, we've got a big cross on our building, and I think sometimes it is just a piece of signage to us. It is a, a piece of jewelry to us. It is a, a piece of religious, you know, paraphernalia. But you got to remember, the cross was like the guillotine. <laughs> the cross... The cross is an instrument of death. It's like a noose. It's like the firing range or the firing squad, the lethal injection, the electric chair. These things are shameful. Imagine having a big guillotine up on, our, <laughs> on a sign. Yeah, come to church here. It's like, ah, no thanks. Well, that's what the cross is. It's an instrument of torture. We, sometimes I think we forget that. It was a shameful thing for Jesus to go to the cross. Crucified, most likely naked. Think about that. The Son of God, God in flesh. And the worst part of the cross wasn't the physical torment, but it was the separation from the Father. It was the sin of, of all the earth, of all humanity being placed upon his shoulders. This is what he endured for you and for me. He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. 1 Corinthians 5.21. This is the beauty, though, of the cross, that though it is such a a shameful and horrific instrument of torture, it represents to us how God can take something so awful and redeem it and use it for his purposes. 
the death of his son, he takes and he makes it into the salvation for all mankind, for all of humanity. And this, again, was the joy that was set before Jesus. He knew, yes, there is this, this affliction, this, this horrific thing that I must pass through, this cup that, that I must drink, but it is going to accomplish eternal salvation. So, Jesus, our example of faith, who endured the cross, who despised its shame, but now has sat down at the right hand of the Father. Notice what it says. The right hand of the throne of God. That while there was this temporary separation from the, from the Father, while there was this horrific agony of the cross and the, the sin of, of all mankind, he looked forward and he saw there's resurrection on the other side of the cross. And there's glory after that. Jesus, three days later, after he was dead, he rose again. He spent some time on earth with, with his disciples, about 50 days. And then in Acts chapter 1, it says that Jesus ascended up through the heavens. And what did he do? He sat down. Why is Jesus seated tonight? That should be of great comfort for you and for me. Why is he seated? Because his work is finished. He is seated because he is in a place of rest. He is not wringing his hands. He is not anxious. He is not worried. He is not concerned of all that you're going through, of all the concerns that you have. Guess what? Jesus is not worried. Remember that time when Jesus was um, with his disciples out on the water and there was a storm and everything was going on and they were taking on water in the boat and the disciples are freaking out. Where's Jesus? Asleep. Because he didn't care? No, he cared. But he knew they were going to make it to the other side. He wasn't worried. He knew they weren't going down. And Jesus is with you tonight in the boat. He's not worried. He's not concerned. The boat isn't going down. You're not going to sink. <laughs> He's going to get you to the other side. Okay, we need to trust him. He is here described as seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Not only does that show that his work is finished, but also his power at the right hand. That's to be at the right hand is to be in the place of power. Jesus is in control. So let us trust him. Let us look to him. Let us wait upon him. And yes, there are things that we're going to have to endure. Just like Jesus endured the cross, we too are going to have to face the cross. Face that, for us, with, with that self-denial. Death to self. The loss of our pride. The loss of our own power. That's okay. That's part of the process. Because on the other side of the cross, guess what? There's resurrection. There's resurrection. There's hope. There's life. There's joy. Amen? All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for these words. Thank you for this encouragement. Hmm. Lord, I pray for all of us tonight. That, Lord, we would lay aside that weight, that sin that so easily besets us, Lord. That we would run the race that you've set before us with endurance. Father, help us to look unto Jesus right now. That we would get our eyes off of other people, Lord, the uh, circumstances, Lord, our eyes would be fixed right now on you, on you, Jesus. 
And Lord, we cast our cares and our concerns upon you right now, knowing that you're with us in the boat. <laughs> that you're, you're seated right now at the right hand of God, and, and you right now are interceding for us ever living to make intercession for the saints. Thank you. Lord, I pray you'd strengthen your people. Help us just to continue to run another day. That we might run without a backpack full of rocks, Lord, without those distractions, Lord, that we might run unencumbered by the sin that so easily besets us. And we ask this, Lord, in, in Jesus' name. And right now I do pray, Lord, if there's anyone here who has yet to give their life to you, they'd open up their heart right now. Anyone here right now who wants to be set free from their sin can call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. It's that simple. That anyone who here would acknowledge their need for salvation, their need for forgiveness of their sin, if they would simply say, Jesus, save me. I believe that you died for my sin. I believe that you rose again so that I might be saved. Save me. You call upon his name. He will rescue you. That is the gospel. That is the hope that we have. We love you, Lord. We bless you. We thank you in Jesus' name.